this man sure looks to be the life of the party. That's why he's behind bars. In fact, he was executed by the state. He was a serial killer after all. And just like Albert Fish, well, it seems he didn't mind taking the lives of children as well. That's how disturbed this man was. An alcoholic named Peter Kudzinowski, or at least something along that line. And today I wanted to share his story. So let's begin. Now Peter was born on August 13, 1903 in Dixon City, Pennsylvania to Polish immigrant parents Paul and Veronica. He is frequently and incorrectly referred to as Polish born. Well then, with such a name what do you expect man? Anyways, he was the youngest of four boys and grew up in Scranton area. He suffered a skull fracture in the 6th grade after diving into a shallow pool. This had a noticeable effect on his behavior and he refused to go to school anymore. He subsequently worked a stint in the coil mine and later held a job somewhere at the railroad yards and this was all in it seems first in the state of Pennsylvania and then the railroad yards work was in a town in Hudson County, New Jersey. Now you see there, if you take only this part that they have documented about his early life, well first of all, maybe that head injury had something to do with him pretty much going insane, who knows. Sometimes that's speculated, you know, with brain damage, your personality can change dramatically. So I don't know for sure if this was actually the reason, but ultimately, you see, after all of this stuff that seems fairly normal still, he went on a little murder spree of his own. Because it was a 20 year old Harry Quinn in Scranton on March 8th, 1924 that was murdered by Peter. The two were friends and were traveling to Springbrook Township where Quinn was looking to land a job with the Springbrook Water Supply Company. Peter had introduced himself as Ray Rogers and Royal Lambert to some of Quinn's family members on what turned out to be the last day they would hear anything from Quinn. After the two of them had gotten into an altercation over a bottle of whiskey, Peter crushed Quinn's head with a rock. His older brother later recalled that Peter came to visit him, told him he had been in a scrape and needed money to leave town, without mentioning what had actually happened. Not having heard from Quinn in a few years, his family members presumed he had abandoned them and had been looking to get in touch with him through newspaper advertisements. You know, that's actually kind of tragic if you think about it. Family members thinking, oh my son left us, he abandoned us, but meanwhile he's actually dead as fuck. He's just rotting away somewhere because his skull got crushed after an altercation with Peter over a bottle of whiskey. Yes, I mentioned, he's an alcoholic, right? You know, that's what happens then, they get very upset over not having their drink. Now Peter also admitted to murdering Julia and then another very strange last name that I don't even dare to pronounce. It's so bizarre. But she was a five year old girl from Jersey City and she was at a school picnic at a lake on August 19th, 1928. Although after he was captured he told reporters he had doubts that he had actually murdered her. You know those doubts could actually happen because of the alcohol, you know. Bad memory blackouts. You see, to me, this, this doesn't sound that strange. Maybe to somebody else, they're like, well, how can you have doubts about it? Well, it could be because he might have been intoxicated during these murders itself. But then his final victim was a seven-year-old boy named Joseph Storoli. He met this boy again, oh, look at this, in a half-drunk state, late afternoon on November 17th, 1928 on 1st Avenue in East Village, New York. Peter accosted two other children at the same location, but they ran away. He lured the boy away with the promise of a box of candy and a visit to a motion picture show. He then took him by the Port Authority Trans Hudson train to Journal Square in Jersey City and finally walked him to the New Jersey Meadowlands. When Joseph tried to get away, 
Peter knocked him down and hit him several times. Worrying that the boy's cries would attract passing cars, he slashed his throat, covered the body with the boy's overcoat, and left him. Now these are the details they had documented about the murders, right? Although they don't seem to sound nearly as grotesque as Albert Fish, they do point out that these two people were active in around uh, the same period of time. Now he was jailed in Detroit for public intoxication. He confessed to Storelli's murder to his jailer, who laughed at him. Peter was released after sobering up. On December 3rd, 1928, he drunkenly staggered up to a police traffic booth and told the officer there that he was wanted by the police. Upon being asked whether he meant for murder, he replied, you'll find out. In jail again, he was interviewed by Detroit detectives who obtained the rough edges of his confession. He was primarily motivated to confess by the weight of his conscience, stating, I'm willing to pay the penalty, and the sooner it's over, the better. I had to confess, it was troubling me. He was quickly transported to Jersey City to stand trial. The state brought in a medical expert who characterized him as possessing a psychopathic personality. The defense brought its own expert to analyze the x-rays made after the diving incidents in his youth. He was found guilty of first degree murder on January 17, 1929. When asked if he had anything to say before the sentence was passed, he remained silent. He was sentenced to die in the electric chair at Trenton State Prison in the week of February 24th. He stated he was ready to die and felt he would probably commit more murders if he were ever set free again. Now his father had suffered a complete breakdown upon learning of his son's deeds, with his health reportedly declining very rapidly and aging in years. Paul died on June 23rd while his son was held on death row. He lost an appeal on October 14th. A final appeal to Governor Morgan Foster Larsen of New Jersey to have his death sentence commuted to life in prison on grounds of insanity was denied on December 17th. Now Peter himself appeared unfazed by his conviction, but on the night of his execution by the electric chair on December 21st, he appeared nervous and was unable to repeat the prayers uttered by his priest immediately before death. Now with that being said, dear viewer, Never forget to have some sweet dreams.